First of all, thank you for inviting me. These are a lot of fun to give. I like to give these talks. I'm going to talk to you about clocks. What is a clock? What is time? How do we keep it? How do we decide what time it is? Um, you're going to come to know that there's going to be a lot of agreements, a lot of sort of human interaction involved. And we're going to go all the way through atomic clocks. Now, I work for the Naval Observatory. It's a US government agency, so the next slide's really boring, is my disclaimer. Um, <laughs> So I'm here to talk to you about clocks. We're going to have a lot of fun, but nothing that I say should be construed as the opinions or policy of the US government or the Navy or anyone. Um, so first, a roadmap. I'm going to question your assumptions about time and clocks and how you might think about them, what we're going to build them. Then we'll start going through history. I'll talk about early history of clocks. I'll spend um, a little while talking about longitude. Then we'll move into time zones, increasingly modern clocks, and then how the world starts to agree about how we're going to keep time. And then we'll segue into the US Naval Observatory and atomic clocks, atomic fountains, uh, which is sort of what I do, and then how that applies to the military and keeping time. And finally, we'll talk about time transfer. So first question here is, what time is it? Well, the simple question, it, the simple answer is, it's what your clock says. Um, but in some sense, it's a very unsatisfying answer. It, it depends on whether your clock is running, whether I can even tell you what time it is. And, and how did you set it? What did you set it against? Um, and there are going to be more questions when you start digging in a little further, like what, um, what did you set it against and why did you trust it? What are the units? Are they seconds? Can you define that? I know some of you can, but we'll, we'll get to that. We'll define seconds. Um, how well did your t clock tick and keep these time units that I'm not going to let you define yet since you set it? And so then I'm, I'm going to claim we need to think about what a clock actually is. Okay, so what's a clock then? Uh, simple answer, it's an oscillator and a counter. Okay, um, oscillators are just repeating features of nature. So it's something that comes back to an initial state. So the Earth spinning and orbiting is a repeating feature of nature. It's sort of the classic repeating feature of nature. Hey, it's light again. It's something oscillated, something repeated in itself. Um, your pulse is another oscillator. So is a pendulum, um, so is an atom but that's getting ahead of ourselves. That'll be later in the talk. So you've picked your oscillator now. Now what do you do? You have to count repetitions. So we're gonna have a counter. We're gonna count these repetitions. We're gonna store them. Those can be hands on a dial. Those can be marked off, marks on a wall. We'll call that a calendar eventually. Um, if you're talking about electronic device, it's gonna be the state of some electronic register inside of your device. Um, one big problem is going to be in the construction of mechanical clocks, and that is that you don't mess with your oscillator while you're counting it. The process of counting a mechanical oscillator is often very disruptive to the oscillator itself. In general, we're going to call this an escapement. Um, so now we have our counter, we have our that's tied to an oscillator. So what's the time? Well, it's whatever number is in your counter. And yes, that's a very unsatisfying answer. Um, the units depend on what you counted. So maybe it's days. Maybe you counted when the sun came up again. Maybe it's seasons. It's when the wheat started to grow again or when the ice melted. Um, maybe it's seconds. But wrapped up in all of this is we must agree on conventions. We must agree on what we're counting from and what we're counting with and how we're counting. So we agree to count on some point from some point in the past. And we're in agree upon the units. And we're going to agree on how to realize them. So we're going to have to start to build artifact standards. So having an agreement that says, oh, we're going to count this following way, is at the end, we're going to have to build actual physical clocks and count with them. So a convention, yep, a convention, it's, it's, it's exactly that squishy. It's exactly that inexact. So an additional complication to fold into the whole issue here, because I talked about we can philosophically define what clocks are, how we're going to count, what we're going to use for our system of times. Now we have to build our physical clocks, and physical clocks always diverge from each other in the time they're going to tell you. They always, always drift apart. So the standard saw in the clock construction industry, like me, is that you know it's either very depressing or it's job security, right? <laughs> so, um, so to wrap up again, we have to agree on a reference, and we have to coordinate then, because our clocks are going to drift apart, and this is going to be called time transfer. There's a wonderful quote by Seneca here. Um, it's actually a much more wonderful quote as it's written here. If you go back and find the original, it's actually about a one-page run-on sentence where he makes this comment in the middle, but it's a wonderful quote. <laughs> yeah. um, so what do we want in a clock? 
we're going to have to choose, we're going to have to pick these conventions, we're going to have to pick our construction methods. We want a very regular rate. So we want to have it tick at a rate this is the same today as tomorrow. We also want to have very small influences from the environment. We'd like it to not be sensitive to temperature or humidity or barometric pressure or whatever. So when I suggested that your pulse might be an oscillator that you might want to use for a clock, that's a really poor choice because that is almost the archetypical bad oscillator influenced by its environment. Um, there are much better oscillators to pick. So you want a universal rate. You'd like everyone to come up with the same definition of, a, let's call it a second. We'll, we'll jump ahead and we'll call it a second. We'd also like to be accessible. So cheap would be good, so everyone can have their own clock and not tied to geography. We're gonna see that's gonna be a really difficult problem. So now I'm gonna start going through history. Once we've framed the problem, the idea of what, what we're gonna try and solve. So we'll start with the early clocks. The earliest clocks are called calendars. <coughs> Um, now, a couple points the, at a couple points in this presentation, they're going to be a little kind of, well, they're orange on my screen. They're slightly less orange here. Um, references that I will commend to you uh, to read. They're wonderful backgrounds, and you're all in the library, so go find the books. Read them. They're wonderful. Um, David Ewing Duncan wrote a book about calendars. So wonderful, interesting, deep history that I won't cover. So you, a calendar is just simply marking off days on something. So you mark off days, the, the repeating interval, once again, is very easy, it's when the sun came up next. But this whole pattern has a larger cycle, and you might want to detect that as well. That might be very useful to you. Now, a very crude way to detect that cycle would be to do something kind of macroscopic, physical in your environment. Look and see when the ice melts on your pond, when the river starts running. Now, that's a very useful marker through a lot of history. When the ice melts in your pond will probably give you a pretty good idea of when you can go down to the river and catch fish when the fish will be running, when you can plant your crops and they won't die. Um, to do better, however, though, you need to start looking at the suns and the stars. That's, those are really much more precise ways of deciding when we've gone around and, and the orbit has repeated itself. And there's the aha moment here. Chris is coming from an observatory. And this is going to be a theme here. The observatories are going to be important. Now, once again, labeling is going to be a pure convention. What you call March is completely arbitrary. What you call the beginning of your year is completely arbitrary. And people long ago made choices that were completely arbitrary and may not be our choices. Stonehenge is a calendar. Um, going forward for, with early clocks, we'll have water fire in the earth. Now, not the earth or rotating sand. Um, so water clocks, you just have water drip out of the container and you see how much water you have left or how much water you've, you've accumulated. Um, off here, we have a water clock. This is actually cascading water going down in, in buckets, and there's a little clapper. That's part of the escapement that's going to ring when you get to a certain time. Uh, that's a Chinese clock. That's a current clock. It's on display in an observatory in China. Um, you can have a, an hourglass. You're going to flip it over. And sand's going to go through, and then if you have an attendant, and they, this is what people used to do, you have an attendant that's going to flip your hourglass back over and put a mark on, a, on the wall, um, that can be a clock as well. Candles were used as clocks. You would mark off hour markings, and you would burn them during the night. Now, in all instances, these things are calibrated. They have to be related back to what you're going to call for truth for your timekeeping system. And at this point in history, really, it's been established that it's the sun. So these are all devices that get calibrated back to the sun for truth. The nice thing about these oscillators, they don't require the sun to be out. So they're used when it's dark, mostly. OK, I mentioned the sun's the best clock you have. And at this point in history, and we're still fairly early history, sundials are going to be the most precise way to read out the time from the sun. Sundials are beautiful, wonderful objects that are much more subtle than you might, uh, might guess. So if you want to figure out a local clock that's the sun, you don't need a sundial. If you all you want is sort of crude approximations of time, you have sunrise, you have sunset, you have noon, you can pretty much schedule a day by that. Um, if you have a more complex day, you might want to divide up into smaller increments, hours, say, this is a sundial. This is a, um, a horizontal sundial, so it's a flat surface. This is called the gnomon. This is what casts the shadow on your sundial. It's always called a gnomon if it casts a shadow on a sundial. And this edge is tilted up from the surface. That edge is actually aligned to be parallel to the rotation axis of the Earth. And that's important. That defines how you're um, going to cast the shadows. You can see that this one uh, is claiming that it's almost 1 o'clock. Now, this is, however, an inherently local time. 
if you move someplace else on the Earth to a different longitude at the same instant of time, if you know, we can you allow me to coordinate time in ancient times, the shadow will be at different places. So it's inherently local. It's a, it's a readout that depends on where you are. Um, it, however, doesn't do it perfectly. At various times of the year, your sundial will lie to you if you had a perfect reference to compare it against. And this is um, actually what you will see, the phenomenon is called an analemma. And it's sort of the answer to the question of, it's a constant time of day, why is the sun not where I expect it to be? The reason is because the Earth's orbit is not perfectly circular and we're not spinning normal to the Earth's orbit. So the Earth's axis is tilted. And then as the Earth goes around the sun, the orbit is elliptical. These two have necessary physical um, uh, consequences that cause the sun to, at different times of the year, trace out this figure. This is a picture of what would happen. This is a simulation. There are some gorgeous, gorgeous solar photography pictures online. I, however, do not have permission to use them, so I couldn't use them. Um, so this is a simulation. This is all, you know, scientists faking things on the sky. This is um, where the sun would be. This line is sort of the average location. So that would be the average location you would draw on your sundial, but there's going to be errors. And here's my one plot for the, for the whole talk. This is another way to, to express. This is called the equation of time. And almost everything I've been talking about here is referenced in these, these displays you've seen back here. So there actually is, there's a clock that self-references for the equation of time back in the display. Um, not a clock, a picture of a clock in a book. So there are times of the year. This is as you march through the year. So this is, that's 360 days. So this is sort of one year from here to here. And there's part of the year where the sundial's behind and part of the year when the sundial's ahead. So if you want to build a really, a better sundial, you correct using this information of the equation of time, and it often looks like beautiful analemmas drawn on your sundial, or your gnomon looks like an analemma. Um, the topic of sundials can go on for an hour talk by itself. So I'm gonna give you one other different type of sundial. This is a vertical sundial, and these things are gorgeous. Uh, this is a tower in Norwich, England. Uh, this is a vertical sundial. This is the gnomon again. It's aligned parallel to the um, Earth's rotation axis. Now let's, this is a north or south facing dial. This is an east or west facing dial, and this is a gnomon that once again is aligned hor uh, parallel to the Earth's axis, but now it's not sticking out of the page anymore. It's parallel to this plate. So the lines it draws are pretty much straight lines going across. In fact, on the bottom here, we have patterns of, as you go from a south-facing dial, which looks like that one, to a north, uh, to a west-facing dial, which looks sort of like this one, you get all these beautiful intermediate patterns as well. Um, sundials are, like I said, wonderful, interesting topic. Um, the next big step past sundials are pendula. Pendulum clocks are very regular oscillators, and they have some interesting features, one of which is that they are universal. So they only depend on the local value of gravity and the length of the pendulum. That's, that's all. Um, they can be powered by weight additionally, which makes them unattended good oscillators. Uh, Galileo is credited with realizing that they would be good oscillators, not actually building good oscillators based on pendula. That was uh, Christian Huygens, and that's also referenced back in the, in the display. Um, Galileo is claimed to have timed chandeliers in church, and he actually used his pulse to time the chandeliers. So um, it tells you that, first of all, he was probably very calm, and second, he was bored um, at the time. <laughs> so, this is also interesting that it's a, once again, it's another clock comparison measurement that he made. Um, it turns out a pendulum isn't perfect, and you can detect with a pendulum the bulge in the Earth. The Earth isn't round. And the difference at sort of sea level on the equator, um, between gravity at, at the equator and gravity elsewhere, you can measure with a pendulum. Uh, this is actually a gorgeous pendulum called a reefler clock uh, that's inside of an a uh, glass vacuum vessel. There's a great book that ha talks not only about pendulum clocks, but lots of other history of clocks and time by Joel and Barnett, uh, Time's Pendulum. This is a picture of an escapement. So I mentioned that you, it's very difficult to take a mechanical clock and get the information out. And once again, there's 
beautiful work on escapements back in the, in the uh, exhibit. And this is a picture of a very complicated escapement called a grasshopper escapement. I won't go into the details, but basically this wheel's always trying to rotate and this escapement is stopping it and then it's gonna grab with the other side and then it's gonna release it and it's gonna let it move one tooth. And it can do this in a way without perturbing the pendulum. This is the pendulum that goes down to a bob that's cut off on the bottom of the screen. Um, and this, in fact, is the tick and talk you hear in a pendulum clock. It's the escapement. It's something whacking against the escapement gear in your pendulum clock. Um, so now I'm going to go on to the first big technological and social problem that was solved by clocks. And this is the longitude problem. I'm going to skip to the bottom of the slide first. You should come back here on October 11, and you should hear David Sobel talk about the longitude problem. I'm going to talk to you for four slides about this, and it's a great story. Um, so not only should you come and hear her talk, you should buy her book or check out her book. It's called Longitude. Um, if you love the book as much as I do, you will buy the illustrated Longitude, which is also a collab collaboration will with Will Andrews, who used to be the scientific instruments curator at the uh, Harvard Library. And it has unbelievable illustrations and wonderful explanations of the illustrations in it as well. OK, enough plugging. So the longitude problem. The longitude problem boils down to where equals when. Um, finding your latitude, and, and we're actually we're talking about C here. Because you have pendula on ground, pretty good. You know the ground isn't moving. You know where down is. Pendula depend on knowing where down is. At C, much, much harder. So latitude is relatively easy. Um, Think about the pole star. You can go find where the pole star is, and you can measure your angle down from the pole star, and now you know your latitude. Your longitude, however, if you're going to go look at stars, you need to know how much the Earth has turned out from underneath the stars. You need to know what time it is. So the way people used to navigate is you would go down to a fixed latitude where you knew the island was out in the middle of the ocean. And then you would say, I'm sure I'm on the west side of the island, and you sail east at constant latitude until you run into the island. That's the way they would navigate. Um, unfortunately, your ability to figure out how close the island is, is really is really terrible. You're dead reckoning, and you may run into the island during a storm at night, in which case you're probably going to run into the island. Um, horrible, horrible loss of life, loss of goods, um, and some very famous crashes in England induces England to offer a prize. In, 19, in 1714, England offers a prize of 20,000 pounds. That's huge. I did a rough calculation. It's about $50 million today. This is huge. Um, so there's the longitude prize now. It's $20 million, sorry, 20 million, $50 million, 20,000 pounds, for a half a degree on a great circle. That's 30 miles. That tells you how bad they were at this. This is really crude, and this is going to change the world. Uh, so 30 miles, huge. That's only two minutes of time, however. And it must be practicable and useful. The test for the clock-based solutions were going to be that you had to sail to and from the West Indies. This takes six weeks. And you must not err by more than three seconds per day. All I did was I divided two minutes by six weeks to get three seconds per day. This is really hard because there's going to be a horrible environment. It's going to get cold. It's probably going to get wet and you don't know where down is. Um, there are many competing astronomical methods. And it was actually kind of a joke that a mechanical method like a clock could possibly solve this problem. The astronomers are the timekeepers. And they're sure that you're, they're going to solve the problem with lunar eclipse methods or the phase of the rotation of the Jovian satellites. Um, so it's actually a real long shot that a basically uneducated clockmaker named John Harrison pulls it off. Uh, he builds several clocks over many years, 1730 to 1772. One interesting note is over this time, the Longitude Board becomes the first scientific funding agency, keeping these efforts alive in, with various researchers. Uh, along the way, I mean, th this guy John Harrison is a genius. He invents many things along the way including the bimetallic strip, which is a clever arrangement that allows you to have self-temperature compensating spring systems. Uh, he invents the caged roller bearing as part of making his clocks better. Uh, the story includes politics, intrigue, scientific battle, scientific misconduct, and more. Um, I'm not going to get into it. Um, so 
H4, the fourth Harrison clock, finally passes the test. It does it in two trials. Uh, the first was to Jamaica, the second to Barbados. Uh, the first one in 1761 to 1762 is better than two minutes. He's forced to do it again. The second time in 1764, also passes the test. Uh, he finally ends up getting the prize in 1773. There's lots of, like I said, politics and intrigue in the meantime. After H5 also passes the test and King George III intervenes. Turns out King George III was a science and technology buff and was interested in the problem. Uh, K1, K1 is the first Kendall clock. It is a copy of H1, H4, which is this beautiful clock here. Um, it sails with Cook in the Pacific and was, was um, regarded by Cook as the most valuable member of his crew. So this, this solves a huge, huge problem. Um, this clock lives in the Greenwich Museum. Um, it's five inches across. It's not a pocket watch, it's actually a fairly large watch. So that's the first big, huge technological problem solved by clocks. Um, and here's, another, here's a convention problem we're going to get to now, is time zones, local times, and the rail. This is actually going to be a time problem that's brought on by technology in some sense. Now on land, you have access to local time. You have the sun. You have access to really good local time. So let's take the case of England. England is only minutes wide you think about how wide it is, east to west. Uh, if you were to take London as ground truth for the time in England, and that's what they tended to do, um, it's sort of 15 minutes one direction and seven the other. So this is not an issue if your time transfer method is someone walking from one side of England to the other. You'll just keep local time as you go. First problems arise when you start having fast coach services. Because fast coach services want to sell you their service, the way they're going to sell you their service is they're going to tell you they're more on time than their competitor or they get you there faster. And the comparisons are not well defined. Which time are you using for your start and your stop time between Norwich and London? Um, this really comes to a head with rail travel. With rail travel, you have serious physical problems if you have a clock coming from Norwich heading one direction, a clock coming from London heading the other direction, and they're keeping a different time and you want to make sure they're not going to head down the same piece of rail at the same time. So yes, lots of trains run into each other and lots of people die. Um, it turns out that what then starts to happen is there's a phenomenon of keeping rail time and local time. This actually leads to the production of dual face watches in England so you can keep track of what your local time is and of what the rail time is. Uh, by about 1848, the English rail gets together to decide this is a problem, they're going to standardize on London time. Uh, it takes till 1855 when most local time is stamped out in England. Uh, it's replaced by Greenwich Mean Time. Now this is a relatively easy problem. They have one time zone. What about the US? We're a lot wider than one hour. Um, in the US, the local railroads are the reason why we have problems and we, with this local time and coordination of local time. Turns out the rail companies in the US keep their own time. Every company decides it's going to keep its time independently. And how they choose tends to be the founding city of the rail line. So the Baltimore and Washington rail line keeps Baltimore time, and the Ohio and uh, Ohio Railroad would keep Ohio time. Uh, so this is a great quote here, I'll let you read it. But you, know, you can show up in a train station, and it's quite possible you will have to deal with four separate times. What your watch says from where you came from, because that was your local time, the rail time of the train you came in on, the rail time, tr time of the train that you're trying to catch, and then the city is going to keep a different time because they're going to have their own local time. Um, this is a serious problem. Now, there was a talk here that you should have gone to uh, on September 13th where this was covered. There actually is interesting information that you can get to from the Linda Hall Library website that goes into more of this as well. I read your website. Um, so there are people that tr propose solutions for this, so different time zone solutions. Not coincidentally, most of these people are railroad men. Charles Dowd is the first person to really champion having four time zones in the US. This is in the 1860s. Initially, his meridian that he chose was DC. Meridian is going to be where you, your reference point. Um, then he sort of wises up and picks, picks Greenwich. Um, initially, the implementation, though, is really clunky. Uh, the way he wants to implement it is a table of literally 8,000 separate corrections for what your local time is compared to the standard time. This is not good. 
Um, standard time finally gets adopted. Uh, it was actually championed vigorously by someone named Stanford Fleming. This is also a railroad man. Unfortunately, his efforts were destined, it looked like, to die until they were picked up by William Allen. And William Allen campaigns for standard time, and the way he gets it done is he convinces the observatories to just change over. So he doesn't go to the local time. He just, everyone's getting their time locally off of the observatories. Observatories look at the stars, and they have time balls that they drop. The time ball at New Year's Eve, that's actually a really slow time ball. Time balls drop fast. That's what they're supposed to do. You set off a cannon, often as a warning. You go and you look at the time ball, and it goes boom, and you, you set your watch. Um, so he convinces all the observatories to move to standard time. So on November 18, 1883 at noon, all the observatories drop their time ball, reference to standard time, and it's game over. Because now we have a time transfer problem. Everyone trusts them. Everyone trusts them as truth. It just propagates. Uh, national legal adoption has to wait till 1918 as part of Daylight Savings Time Initiative. And that's actually a war effort initiative. Um, worldwide, there's an International Meridian Conference in 1884. And the proceedings of the International Meridian Conference in 1884 is in the room behind you as well. Um, they meet to discuss the coordination of world time. They agree to use Greenwich. Now, the exact year that the um, the country implements that varies. And in fact, the US, it's, it's later than 1884 because that comes in a legal definition that has to pass governmental issues. Um, some countries take a long time. And some of those stories are actually interesting. One that's kind of humorous is France. France doesn't like England being the definition. They prefer Paris. And in fact, they insist on Paris. And they define Paris mean time. It is, however, shifted to agree to Greenwich mean time. Okay. Um, Liberia actually waits until 72 to join. Until then, they were resolutely 44 minutes and 30 seconds different from everyone else in the time zone. Um, another interesting tidbit, China has one time zone. They used to have time zones. They don't anymore. They have one time zone. And there are actually are local tolerated definitions of, of local time. There is one area of China that just unofficially wink and nod operates two hours off of Beijing time. Um, Hong Kong and Macau are, are special cases. They're special administrative regions. They have their own time. Um, so those are sort of two big historical touch points. Now I'm going to go back through clock technologies. We're going to, we're going to keep um, moving forward with better and better clocks through history. This is the pinnacle of pendulum clocks. This is the short clock. Um, I've mentioned that disturbing your oscillator is a big problem. This is an effort to do the best possible job of having an undisturbed pendulum. This metal can is evacuated and has a pendulum inside. That's the master oscillator. It has electronic feedback linking it between this master oscillator and this slave oscillator here. The slave oscillator has an escapement on it. The escapement is also electronic. The advantage of using electronic escapements are you have very little back action on the pendulum. Um, these are good to hundreds of microseconds error for one day forward in prediction. That's phenomenal for a, a uh, pendulum oscillator. In fact, these are used at USNO from 1930 to 1945. That's really late. That's really recent. Uh, they're replaced by quartz. Um, what's USNO? We'll answer that in about four slides. Um, quartz, quartz crystals, that's the next technology that, that is the technology that displaces the pendulum. Um, quartz is piezoelectric. Piezo means pressure, electric means electric. So if you squish a piezoelectric crystal, you get an electric charge. If you put an electric charge on it, it squishes. Um, that's a really interesting property. Another interesting property is it's a single, beautiful single crystal that is very stiff. So it will ring like a bell. Bells are good oscillators. That's a sign of a good oscillator. So you take your disc of, of um, quartz and you ping it, and it will ring very, very pure tone. The nice bit about a piezoelectric bell is that I can ring it electronically and I can sense it electronically. So this allows me to build an all electronic oscillating, oscillating clock. Um, it's this piezoelectricity as a property is discovered in um, 1880. The first oscillator is built in um, just before 1920 and the first practical clocks are about 1927. Um, but these really kill off the pendulum clock. Now we're gonna move on to atomic clocks. So the thing that displaces, knocks the quartz crystal off its throne is the atomic clock. Now radar from World War II turns out to be the enabling technology. 
Radar requires microwave um, oscillators. So we get the microwave technology out of places like the Radiation Lab at MIT, and that this is going to allow us to probe atoms. We have a complicated slide here, and this is a reference, and this is an atom here, and this is some stuff to tie it together. So we have an oscillator. Let's say it's a quartz crystal. And I'm going to multiply it up to microwaves. This is the this frequency multiplier chain is stuff that I got from the from radar from World War II. Now I have microwaves. I'm going to shine them on atoms. Think of atoms like little bells. If you shout at them at the right frequency, they will ring sympathetically. And we can sense that using a whole bag of atomic physics tricks they teach us in grad school. So atomic physics happens here, and we're going to be able to, to sense whether or not we're shouting at the atom with the correct microwave frequency. We get that information out, and this just means steer, this means correct. We're going to correct this quartz oscillator so it agrees with the atoms. And then we count the quartz oscillator. That's an atomic clock. All you do is you measure an, ato an atom's internal frequency. They happen to be up in the microwave, and you count them. That's an atomic clock. Now everyone knows how to build an atomic clock. Um, one thing I would like to, to put out in public here, they're not radioactive. It has nothing to do with nuclear decay. It has nothing to do with radioactivity. It has nothing to do with nuclear power. We're talking about light bulb energies here. Um, they're low power um, electron changes, not nuclear physics changes in the atom. Um, so atomic clocks are not only better than quartz, they're enormously better than quartz. This leads to the downfall of the Earth. Um, <laughs> well, the downfall of the Earth is our preferred timing mechanism. Uh, so now we have much better clocks on the Earth. And the Earth has been defining the seconds. So the compromise solution up till now has been to define something called the mean solar day. So you can define this a couple ways. You know, a second is, and I should have said a second is, not mean solar day above those items. A second is one over 86,400 of a day. Or it is one over about 31 million, plus a bunch of other significant digits, of the tropical year 1900. That's the mean solar day. And that is the truth. That is the second, up until 1967. Um, yeah. 1967 we move from the mean solar day to something based on atoms. And we choose cesium. Why do we choose cesium? Uh, cesium has a nice high frequency ground state microwave transition. Um, ignore what I, ground state, that's a red herring, never mind. Um, it has an oscillating frequency inside of the atom that oscillates about 9.2 gigahertz, 9.2 billion times per second. Um, it's a heavy atom, which for practical purposes means when I build an atomic beam, it moves slowly. So the atom stays around a lot longer inside this apparatus because it moves slowly. The only reason I give you that detail is that that's the big lever I'm going to use for my atomic fountains later. Um, it's so a heavy atom, nice high frequency. The really beautiful thing about atoms is everyone's cesium atom is the same. They say it's the same here and in France and in Brazil. It's the same thing. So the world agrees that 91, 92, 631, 770 oscillations of the ground state of the cesium-133 isotope is the second. That's it. That's your second now. We've all agreed. Um, that's the way it works. We, we define truth, right? We've defined our convention. We've all agreed. So now what about realizing that? Realizing the second is a, is a job of building a primary frequency standard. The primary frequency standard is not my job. I work for the Naval Observatory. It, it really isn't. Um, it's NIST's job. So why? Because the second is a base SI unit. Remember SI units? The System International, the, the international units we use for describing everything, including the meter, right? Yeah, right. Um, so defining these units is the job of NIST. That's the National Institute of Standards Technology. Uh, they have two campuses, one's in Gaithersburg, just north of DC, one's in Boulder, Colorado. The Boulder, Colorado places where they do the time and frequency stuff. Um, so they are charged with maintaining the SI units for the nation, because every nation is interested in knowing what the units are. Um, so they're going to build a primary frequency standard. So they make an oscillator based on the cesium-133 atoms. It's got to be cesium-133, because then it, otherwise it isn't the second. Now here are all the caveats. Here's what's hard. Um, unperturbed by electric or magnetic fields, at sea level and at rest. So you have to either correct for and zero out these perturbations, 
or measure them and correct for them. Um, some of those seem kind of silly. Uh, at sea level, it turns out, due to special relativity, if I take a clock and it's sitting on the floor here and it's ticking at a certain rate and I raise it one meter, it just changed its frequency by a part in 10 to the 16. Okay, part in 10 to the 16, who cares, right? Well, these primary frequency standards are defined to a part in 10 to the 15. They're actually better. There are several parts in 10 to the minus 16. You need to know the elevation of your atomic frequency standard to a meter or so if you're, if you're gonna be in the game. Um, so institutions like NIST define the frequencies and they, they build these devices, these physical devices, and they have calibrated frequencies good to better than a part in 10 to the 15. They're some of the most precisely known physical quantities, full stop. Um, now, I've said a bunch of stuff about precisely defined, and I haven't said the word accurate, although this is an accuracy thing they're doing. They are really realizing a quantity. So I'm gonna spend a slide on accuracy and precision. Um, accuracy is how, how well you have realized the measurement of a thing, the actual value of a thing. Precision is, no matter how bad your measurement is, is it the same bad measurement every time? <laughs> They're not mutually exclusive, though. The best way to illustrate this, however, is for those of us that do target shooting. Um, we have a target here, and we're gonna shoot at it. So this pattern right here, this is very precise. It's very repeatable, but it's the same wrong answer every time. So it is precise, but it's not accurate. Accurate would be centered. This is not precise, and it's also not accurate. This is very accurate. That could be a primary standard. It just wouldn't be a very precise one. You'd have to wait a long time to figure out the answer. This one is both accurate and precise. So this is the vision you should have when someone talks to you about an accurate measurement of something or a very precise thing. Um, in general, it's fair to say that NIST is worried about accuracy and the Navy is worried about precision. So long as everyone agrees and has the same very precise answer, everything the Navy and everyone the Navy services for time, all of the DOD, we can all operate. So we care about precision. I won't talk about stability, but basically stability is how much the target's moving out from underneath you. Um, okay, so now we've defined what time it is based on atoms. We've all agreed how we're gonna do this. How are we gonna coordinate? Well, the, we're gonna coordinate through institutions that have been set up by the Treaty of the Meter. The Treaty of the Meter was signed in 1889. This is an international agreement about how we're going to deal with units and things and artifact standards. Um, the BIPM is the international keeper of these units. It's a little enclave outside of Paris. Um, that stands for Bureau, International Bureau of Weights and Measures. And the words are all French, but the order's wrong for French. And the lore is, that they, the compromise was that the acronym would make sense in nobody's language. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's plausible if I tell you one other thing. Your dues as a nation to the BIPM are a scaled version of your UN dues. It is that political a thing. Um, so what we've done is we've all agreed to send our clock data to the BIPM. So USNO owns a bunch of clocks. We'll measure them, we'll send them over there. We'll get to how we send them later. Uh, the BIPM then tells us what time it was, and that's called universal coordinated time. And that's not a typo. It's what time it was. It's not what time it is. We get the data back in one month batches, a half a month later. So on about the 15th of the month, we're gonna get a bunch of data. So about the 15th of October, we're gonna get data telling us what time it was throughout the month of September. <laughs> It's, 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 it's honestly, it's the way it works. So if you want to know what time it is now, you have to have your own clock that you're reporting to the BIPM, and you have to guess what time it's going to be. Um, so if you see UTC sub K, where K is replaced by some institution's name, that's that institution's best guess at what time it will be. And UTC USNO is our guess. And once again, I'm gonna define USNO in a minute. So we now have enough time also to take a, a quick detour. There's gonna be a detour here and a detour in a moment. Uh, on, into leap seconds. You guys have probably heard of leap seconds. This is when we either on the transition, um, the first of 
the first month or the first to the sixth month, we add a second or subtract a second. So why are we doing this? Uh, it's the answer to a question. The question is, what do you do when two time scales disagree? I told you that physical clocks always move apart from each other. The two time scales that are disagreeing are the Earth's rotation and atomic time. So the only answer is we've got to force one to agree with the other. That, that's it if we want them to coordinate. It's much easier to add a second to the world's atomic time than it is to change the phase of the Earth. <laughs> so we decide to add a second or subtract a second from UTC. Um, so the Earth is slowing down is the problem, and it's the moon's fault. This is really cool. It's also our fault. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, it's the moon's fault. The moon has exerts tidal forces on the Earth, and that's what sloshes the oceans around. It also distorts the entire structure of the Earth. There are solid Earth tides rolling past us, and they're about a meter high. Um, this is dissipative. This is a lossy process. So you dissipate energy in squishing the Earth and having this big Earth tide roll around. And that changes the spin rate of the system. It slows everything down. So we add or subtract seconds to our time scale to make the Earth spin rate, the Earth spin rate angle, it's called the ephemerity, the ephemeris, excuse me, um, to agree. This is sometimes defended in a, as a practice of keeping the sun overhead at noon to which anyone who is in the business like me will give it a big raspberry and say, because you, know, you saw that in a lemma, right? You saw the errors of the sundial. You saw the errors of where the sun is overhead. So my answer is, if the sun is overhead at noon, almost nowhere, and at most four times per year, <laughs> right? And your analemma is minutes wide. <laughs> um, I can refer you to the US military's opinion on leap seconds, which is that they should not continue. That is, that's policy. I will, I will tell you that you could look that up. Um, so that's what's up with leap seconds. Now this is one of the more egregious examples of steering a really good time scale to a bad one. Okay, um, now we're gonna continue detouring in some sense. Uh, detouring in the sense that I'm not now going through history so much. Um, I'm sort of giving some context of implementation and where I'm from and what I do. Uh, so observatories in the USNO. Now from the start, observatories have been at the center of time key because the Earth and the stars have been our best clock throughout history. Remember when we went over to standardized time, we did that by co-opting all the observatories and getting them to collaborate and change the standard time and then everyone followed. Um, everything from Stonehenge and sundials have been observatories. We start having increasingly centralized efforts, and the US Naval Observatory is the Department of Defense's centralized effort at being an observatory and a timekeeper. This is a picture of our a building in our institution. This is actually our time ball. We have a time ball. Um, we don't drop it regularly. It was built for the special event that was, you know, 1999 to 2000, and for those of us that are actually timekeepers, 2000 to 2001 which is when it actually happened, right? <laughs> you count from one. Um, think about it for a moment. So that's a telescope dome and that's a time ball um, and we've dropped it a couple times and that's the main administrative building. Um, so what do we do at USNO? We actually do more than tell the time. We tell the time and we tell folks what time it is because if you only know what time it is, you don't tell people it's useless. Uh, we measure where the stars are and we make star charts. We tell people where the stars are and where they're going to be. Uh, we measure where the Earth is pointed and where it's spinning, and where its angle is, and how it's wobbling, and tell people about that and how to predict that. All of these are navigation products. All of them are navigation products, and that's why the Navy's interested, and that's why we're in the business. Um, so now I'm going to focus on time service. Let's talk about time. So we define the time for the DOD. It's a definition of truth for the DOD. Whatever UTC USNO says it is, that is the time. Um, it's a joint chief instruction. So UTC USNO is the master clock for the DOD and all other DOD organizations. And because of how ubiquitous our time is, we end up being the de facto time for lots of other endeavors as well. Uh, we figure out what time it is by measuring a whole bunch of physical clocks, roughly 100. 
There are three different construction types of clocks. Different types of clocks are better, have, diff have different properties, and you do better by averaging the optimal combination of the optimal types of clocks. This is a really hard math problem and a hard physics problem, and we're not going to get into it. But the interesting issue here, the interesting takeaway, is times a voted quantity, even at, at the observatory. We're going to vote among a bunch of clocks. And by vote, I mean we're going to have a really smart mathematician write a hard algorithm. Um, and then we distribute this to the users. Now, more on how we do the distribution, but the big punchline is think GPS. GPS is a military system. If you ask GPS what time it is, they're going to tell you what we told them. Um, OK, so now I'm going to go to a, a topic. We have four slides that are near and dear to my heart. It's sort of what my group does and, and how we're pushing timekeeping. So this is sort of the end of the road for currently deployed really good clocks. Um, it's called an atomic fountain clock. It's a microwave clock just like these primary standards I talked to you about. And in fact, the current US primary frequency standards use this same technology I'm described to you, except they use cesium-133 instead of rubidium-87. There are a bunch of geeky technical details why I use rubidium-87. I can build a better precise clock with rubidium-87 than I can build um, with cesium-133. And since I don't care about defining the second, I don't have, I'm not constrained to use cesium. So I pick rubidium. Its oscillation frequency is lower at 6.8 billion cycles per second. Um, the key to all of this is laser cooling. Laser cooling is nifty. See, I avoided saying cool. That's nice. Um, so laser cooling is the practice of shining lasers at atoms in a vacuum chamber and shoving them around, manipulating them. Uh, this is an interesting and revolutionary enough idea that it was worth the Nobel Prize in 1997 to three folks. Um, Bill Phillips from NIST in Gaithersburg, uh, Claude Cointonugi from France, and Stephen Chu from Stanford, who is our current Secretary of Energy. Um, so the way that you shove atoms around with light, first of all, you want to use a laser beam, because it's all the same color, and it's all coming from the same direction. So you have an atom, and it absorbs a photon. Now, a photon is the smallest chunk of light. And there's lots of them in a laser beam. So when the atom absorbs the photon, it absorbs the energy. And it changes its internal state. And we're just going to ignore that right now. So it changes internal energy, but it also recoils from getting the momentum from the photon. Photons carry momentum. It's exactly like me sitting on a sled in winter and someone nailing me with a snowball and I recoil. It's exactly that process. So the, photon, the atom now has recoiled a little bit, not a whole lot of momentum in a photon. It then re-emits the photon, and I can then absorb another photon. Now, it re-emits the photon in a random direction. So I'm going to pull the physicist trick and average that to zero. Um, it doesn't sound like that would be very efficient or very useful, because you, you put your hand in front of the projector, and it doesn't get shoved very hard by the photons. But atoms are really light, individual atoms. And I can repeat this process, doing the right atomic physics games, about a million times per second. You work out the math. And I can accelerate my atoms at 1,000 Gs. You can really move them around. Then I'm going to play other atomic physics games. And I'm going to have laser beams come in from multiple directions. And by playing games with the tunings of the laser light and Doppler shifts, I can make sure that the atom always absorbs photons from the laser beam that is directed so as to slow the atom down. Now I do it in three dimensions. This is what's called an optical molasses. It looks very viscous to the atoms. I can cool the atoms down. I can get them basically not moving. I can get them so not moving that they're moving at about a couple centimeters per second. Now, that doesn't sound very impressive, centimeters per second. But the nitrogen molecules in this room are whacking into all of us at hundreds of miles an hour. So it's really slow. If I convert this to a temperature, it is a couple millionths of a degree above absolute zero. It, it's nifty stuff. It was worth a Nobel Prize. So what we do is we grab a ball of atoms. All of this happens inside a vacuum chamber. So we grab a ball of rubidium atoms. And I can make them nice and cold. And then I mentioned that I can accelerate them at 1,000 Gs. So tossing them is easy. I can toss them a little bit by messing with the light. And I can keep them cold in their kind of center of mass frame. So now I toss this cold ball of atoms up through a microwave cavity. And they go up and they come back down. and there's lots of my hand waving here at this point, right? 
So I'm, gonna, I'm doing what physicists tend to call using intuitive models, using ball and stick models. Um, it's lying, right? So I'm going to lie very creatively and try and convey as much information as possible. So the atoms go up through this microwave cavity and come back down. And I can arrange things such that it looks like I'm asking the atom what its frequency is the whole time. Um, and I'm comparing to this microwave frequency. Then it's going to come back down. I'm going to read out whether or not the, um, my microwave frequency is too high, too low, just right, as arbitrated by the atoms by looking at how much light I see scattered with another laser that the atoms cross. So I'm looking at the atoms for a long time. That's a fundamental win. That fundamental win allows me to build a much, much better clock. Um, so that's an atomic fountain clock. This is, hello, here we go. This is a cutaway of our vacuum chamber. So this is a little more realistic um, drawing of it. So this is where we collect the atoms. We toss them upwards as a microwave cavity. They float up. They come back down. We detect with some laser beams. We actually use two laser beams. See, I was lying. And um, it's all inside of a vacuum chamber. We have inside a vacuum chamber because we don't want background gas atoms slapping into the atoms and knocking them out of the whole experiment. Like I said, nitrogen molecules, hundreds of miles an hour, not good for having the atoms stick around. Um, we toss about 30 centimeters of the microwave cavity, we detect with lasers, and we repeat this whole process. We grab the atoms, cool them to a millionth of a degree, toss them, measure them, do all this sort of stuff every 1.2 seconds. Um, continuing the theme of you have to isolate, isolate, isolate if you're building a clock, we isolate everything in the system. We've already isolated it, putting them inside of a vacuum can. That's important. We're going to wrap them in magnetic shields. This is showing four layers of magnetic shields on the outside. We regulate the temperature with the room. Uh, we regulate the humidity because that's important. And that allows us to have a very, very stable clock. Um, I'm going to segue, I'm going to tell you, explain this for a moment. I, I'm sorry, black body shifts. Um, black body shifts are the response of the atoms to the background radiation, background thermal radiation. Um, something else about us in this room, not only 100 mile an hour molecules hitting us, we're being bathed in radiation and light that's centered around 10 microns. That's the light that thermal imaging cameras use to see things at night. It's about 10 microns long, whereas the light in the room that we're seeing is about a, a micron long, about a half micron. Um, this light that's all around us, that's bathing the atoms, even inside the vacuum chamber, the walls of the vacuum chamber are bathing the atoms in this light. That's good for about two parts in 10 to the minus 14 frequency shift, which is massive on our, in this game. So that's the black body shift. You need to regulate the temperature. Okay, this is a picture of an atomic fountain. So this is the outer magnetic shield, the physics package here. Uh, we affectionately call this the water heater. And um, then all the cool atomic physics happens in there. Two racks of equipment. And we have several of them running and have been for over a year and a half. Uh, four of them running over a year and a half at the observatory. And these are showing stabilities relative to each other at about the part in 10 to the 16 level. That's nanoseconds per year. Nanosecond, 10 to the minus 9. 10 to the minus 9 seconds per year. And in a moment, we're going to talk about why we care about nanoseconds. Um, I'm getting closer. Now, I just talked about a whole bunch of atomic physics. And um, this would be a little more applicable if there were more young folks in the audience. So carry this to the, all the young folks you know. Uh, this is a short advertisement. Um, I just talked a bunch about atomic physics and, and stuff, but I'm not coming from a university. So I'm a physicist. I did my undergraduate and my PhD um, in experimental atomic physics. And getting a PhD was not the road to riches. I have a brother that's a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but I get to work on really interesting problems, really interesting work. And I get to play with unbelievable toys. I mean, really cool toys. Um, and very few of us that go down this road of being an undergraduate and getting their PhD in physics end up as professors, but that's okay. But realize that going in, that that's what you're doing. Okay. Time transfer. Back in the talk. Um, we're almost done. So time transfer is the act of coordinating and comparing times. So this has come up before. You've seen this throughout. You already know about time transfer. The trains and their passengers were a time transfer, transfer mechanism that drove us to standardize time and, and have time zones. 
the longitude clocks were time transfer mechanisms. They transferred time from where you were at a known longitude to another time, and that time transfer allowed you to determine, to interpret the error as your longitude. Time balls, you've seen. Um, astronomical observations at different observatories are time transfer mechanisms. So USNO, we do time transfer as well. We have a voice announcer. You can call that number. It will tell you what time it is. Uh, it'll be good to about a tenth of a second. That's about how well you can pick, you can listen to a phone and, um, and you know, hit a button and such. We get about four million callers a year. Slightly more impressive is network time protocol. That's computers asking other computer servers, like ones we have at the observatory, uh, what time it is. That will time up a computer about 10 milliseconds, so a hundredth of a second. We get about 18,000 requests per second. Big peaks on the hour. Huge peaks after a leap second. Um, this averages to about a half a trillion requests per year. Uh, GPS is one of our most ubiquitous time transfer mechanisms. We tell GPS what time it is. GPS tells you what time it thinks it is. It's very close to what time we think it is. And in fact, if you have a sophisticated timing receiver encoded in the message from GPS are the corrections to allow you to get even closer to what time it is for us, we, what time we say. And finally, there's two-way satellite time transfer. That's our highest test time transfer mechanism. We set up a communication satellite dish. We bounce off a communication satellite over to you with your um, telecom dish, and we do experiments back and forth in the same direction at the same time, and we cancel out delays, and we get things down to about a nanosecond. There are very few high test users in the military that care about that. Okay, um, now the time transfer, it turns out, is everywhere. So you're surrounded by time transfer all the time. Time transfer is as simple as telling someone what time it is, or setting your watch, setting your watch against what, you have to decide what you trust. Um, household electronics are always transferring time to you. Your holdover oscillator is kind of remembering what time it is. Um, for those of us who remember VCRs, <laughs> yeah. Um, your computer probably checks via NTP. Your cell phone is a time transfer mechanism. All cell towers have GPS receivers. Many cell towers have atomic clocks in them. That's how they efficiently hand off calls as you're walking around the city or driving around the city. Your GPS receiver is an exquisite time transfer device. So it's everywhere around you. So I mentioned GPS a couple times. So everyone's favorite application is GPS. Um, GPS is a constellation of satellites. Fully functional is 24 satellites. It's, it's uh, six orbital planes, four satellites per orbital plane. This is a little GIF of you, know, you sitting on the Earth rotating around and the satellites you can see. This is actually telling you how many satellites are visible at any given time. Um, the GPS constellation is a whole bunch of satellites, all of which have atomic clocks on them, multiple atomic clocks, and they're all shouting the time at you. They're all shouting tick at you. And your GPS receiver is measuring the different delays from the different satellites, the different ticks. So the differences are forming rulers where the units are delay. Now, the way they're broadcasting all this information is microwave, um, uh, signals. Microwave signals are electromagnetic radiation, which is light, which travels at the speed of light. So a nanosecond is a foot. Light travels this far in a, in a nanosecond. So that's why we care about defining things in nanoseconds at the observatory, are these sorts of applications. And that's how GPS works, is literally your GPS receiver, which is everywhere now, right? measuring all of these little rulers to all of these satellites that are whizzing around over our heads, all of which are shouting tick at you. So, time to round up. Circling back around, here are the takeaways, I guess. Clocks or oscillators hooked to counters. Is that simple? And time, what time it is, is largely a human convention. And we build artifacts to implement those conventions, but it's largely a human convention. Clocks have evolved enormously throughout history. And a lot of the drive to improve clocks, or many of the things that have come out of clocks, have been important technological or social problems. And the high precision timekeeping touches all of us every day in many ways. And with that, I would like to thank you, and I'd be happy to entertain your questions. <laughs> If you have a question, I'll come by with a microphone.
Recently, we had an extremely large earthquake, and the question is, do you get involved with how that might change the shape of the earth and time rotation? Uh, the question, sorry, we have a microphone on the question, I need to repeat it. Um, we do have a department called Earth Orientation. Those are the folks that determine where the earth is pointed. They did look at that. Um, you, I think the takeaway was you might have been able to see a small short-term perturbation, but there's nothing long-term in um, the clocks that are defined by the Earth's uh, spin rate and angle and orientation. Uh, much larger effects are surprisingly things like weather. Um, the, the distribution of water in the atmosphere changes the spin rate enormously. Those are much larger. Uh, Dr. Engstrom, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I noticed that almost everything you said is global centric. How do, what's the convention for establishing the time on the International Space Station that's just going around and also on the Curiosity rover on Mars where obviously you have to be concerned about time? Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to plead ignorance on some of this. Uh, What you've asked about the International Space Station, um, at a crude level, my guess is at the second level, you can just uh, pick a location and you can do the transformations. The transformations aren't that hard. Um, at a very high precision level, I've actually been involved with, with analyzing possible clock experiments to the ISS. Um, it's a very subtle problem because the, transfer, the reference frames transformations are not well defined because it's a rotating frame and the, and the Minkowski transformations don't hold for rotating systems. You're smiling, you knew the answer. Um, <laughs> uh, so at the highest precision level, it's a subtle hard problem that you can solve at about the part and 10 of the 16 level, um, maybe part and 10 to the 17 level. Um, from what I know, that, that's a couple years old data. For the Curiosity rover, I honestly have no idea what time reference they're using. We have a question over here. Mm -hmm. There's, okay. Okay. So someone has mentioned that they're they're using the Martian day, and that sounds completely plausible. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't answer with any authority. I can just repeat what you told me. <laughs> any other questions? Oh. I was wondering if you'd be able to say anything about how standardization of time affects the standardization of other physical quantities. Um, there are other SI units that are based that you can base off of time. Um, those are a bit of a moving target, uh, but for instance, the meter is defined um, using base units of time or frequency. It used to be determined in terms of a krypton line. Um, I believe that's been overcome by events. Uh, and I know that you can get to physical measurements through time and frequency based measurements that end up improving uh, limits on physical quantities. And sometimes you can back those back into base units. Um, but really the meter is the only one I can give you with any sort of authority. And that comes with the speed of light, which is defined. I've got two questions. Uh, the first has to do with daylight savings time. Is it worth all the time and trouble it causes us every six months? And the second one is I've heard Neil deGrasse Tyson twice say that uh, global positioning satellites do not have the leap seconds added to them. And thus they're like 15 seconds off from, offic from official time. But I haven't noticed that in whenever I check times. Is that true or not? Um, GPS time, I'll ask them in, um, well, let's see. First, global positioning system. Um, global positioning system keeps its own time scale. It's called GPS time. Uh, it added leap seconds early on in its life and no longer does. It is indeed many seconds off of coordinated time. Uh, your GPS receiver is just correcting for you. And um, sorry, the first one again? Daylight savings, Daylight savings time. Um, oh. 
military systems ignore that. I mean, we, we, you change that for muster. Um, so the military answer is, you know, nothing we do at the observatory reflects daylight savings time. Besides our voice announcer, our voice announcer will say standard time or whatever. Um, uh, in some sense, you're asking a human convenience versus political will question um, for the daylight savings time. Personally, I find daylight savings time advantageous, but I don't live in an agrarian area, nor do I have an agrarian job where it becomes a real pain. Um, so in some sense, I can't answer that. Um, I mean, th those are clearly the trade-offs, are sort of agrarian activities, uh, where that daylight might be better used at a different time of day, or you know, lighting and heating considerations, where it becomes an economic benefit, which is why we had the recent change. Doctor, um, if you fly and you're on Zulu time, and I didn't hear you mention Zulu tonight, Zulu I thought was all around the globe, whether you're Chinese, American, British, Australian, Zulu, Zulu. Comment? Um, that, that would be a standardized time, so it would be like GMT or what was GMT, what is now UTC. Um, so often, the way, th way times are written is you actually will reference the offset. So I think what you're asking is, you know, how do you keep track of the offsets or why don't we just have a, a common time all the way around the globe? And in some sense, we do. So it will be, it was UTC. And if I'm referencing a local time here, the convenience time I will reference is, you know, it's, it's 9.13 but then there'll be an addendum to it, which is UTC plus seven. So I'm just hiding the math. So in effect, we do. But our local conventions for convenience and the fact that when I, I flew from DC to here and I expect it to be light at noon, um, we just added an offset to make it convenient for human convenience. But underlying that is the standardized time. I'm not sure if that answered you, but this. We, we, uh, Dr. Exton, we're here on your left. Mm -hmm, yes. We have time for two more questions. Mm -hmm. How was it established that the day was divided into 86,400 units as opposed to something like 100,000 or something else? <laughs> I, I, wow. Um, I think I knew that at one point. If, if I had to... If I were told I, I have homework and I have to go come up with that tomorrow, I would go to David Ewing Duncan's book on calendars, and I would go there to look. Uh, I don't know your answer, but that's where I would look. I'm sorry. <laughs> From the sublime to the ridiculous, do you prefer an analog or a digital watch? <laughs> um, I have a very nice uh, quartz crystal-based watch with hands on it. It also does have a digital display for doing other things on it, but it's, I use the hands. <laughs> and we'll end with that one. Thank you. And thank you for attending tonight's lecture. Please join us October 11th, Davis Sobel on Longitude, and we will also have a book signing that evening following the lecture, courtesy of Rainy Day Books. And please stop by and uh, visit the uh, on-time exhibition again, which will be on view through March 2013. Thank you and good night. <laughs>